I have uploaded numerous episodes on the Great War, but I have yet to talk about one of the main protagonists, the British Empire. This video depicts the British role in World War I, from the initial phase all the way to the peace treaties. Naturally, it's impossible to include everything in a 10-minute video, so I'll give a brief overview here and expand on certain topics later in future episodes. In August 1914, the government of Prime Minister Herbert Henry Asquith declared war on Germany, officially to preserve the territorial integrity of tiny Belgium, but that was just to make sure the large anti-war element in his Liberal Party would also support the decision. The real goal was the prevention of a German hegemony on the continent, which would make it possible for Germany to focus on the development and further expansion of its navy, and eventually threaten the British Empire. Of course, Britain's Entente allies had to be assisted, but this was more about self-preservation. The Royal Navy blockaded German ports and engaged a smaller German fleet in the Battle of Heligoland Blight, sinking three light cruisers and one torpedo boat. Its superiority was unquestionable, although the German East Asia Squadron, commanded by Admiral Graf Maximilian von Spee, humiliated them in the Battle of Coronel. After that, modern battle cruisers were sent from England to hunt him down, which they did in the Battle of the Falkland Islands in December 1914. In the meantime, the British Expeditionary Force was shipped to Belgium with 85,000 men in six infantry divisions and five cavalry brigades. It managed to stop the German army, but by the end of 1914, the old regular British army had been wiped out, so new recruits were needed to expand the BEF. With 750,000 volunteers, Two armies were established, the territorial force was also expanded, and by March 1915 a third army was set up. These men had to get used to trench warfare, covering some 110 kilometers in the northern sector of the Western Front. After the first Battle of Ypres, smaller engagements followed until April 1915, when the Germans used chlorine gas there. The British suffered 60,000 casualties, but the line held and the BEF continued to grow, despite a brief shortage in artillery shells. The Navy surprised the German fleet in the Battle of Dogger Bank, sinking one armored cruiser, but their own flagship was also seriously damaged. In France, another 60,000 British soldiers were lost in the First Battle of Artois, even though they were now using their own chemical weapons. After this failure, Field Marshal French was replaced by General Douglas Haig, who didn't fare better. It also became obvious that a volunteer army could not keep up with the demands of this modern war, so conscription was introduced in January 1916. This was very useful just a few months later, when the Battle of the Somme started. The goal was to divert German resources from Verdun and give some respite to the French, who were slowly bleeding out. Despite new tactical elements, like the creeping barrage, under which the infantry could advance relatively unharmed, the offensive collapsed after losing half a million men. It was just another meat grinder, after which the number of British volunteers declined significantly. By then, the first tanks appeared on the battlefield, but they could not help the infantry, which continued to struggle against enemy machine guns. What's more, an Irish rebellion had to be put down in Dublin, and fighting continued in Italy, Greece, Mesopotamia and East Africa, while the landings at Gallipoli did not bring the desired quick victory, so half a million Allied troops had to be withdrawn in early 1916. The Navy fared better in that year, although the Grand Fleet could not decisively defeat the German High Seas Fleet in the Battle of Jutland. 28 British dreadnoughts, along with many smaller ships, tried to destroy 16 German ones, and while the British advantage was considerable, skillful maneuvering by German fleet commander Reinhard Scheer prevented a major victory. 14 British and 11 German ships sank, both sides claimed victory, but the German fleet was at least contained. However, air raids became quite frequent, 
as German Zeppelins and then fixed-wing Gotha bombers visited more and more English cities and towns, dropping their payload on the population. The German submarine campaign also became a serious threat to the country's economy as food supplies dwindled. Although certain incidents, like the sinking of the Lusitania back in 1915, forced Germany to restrict its submarine warfare, by 1917 the gloves came off and both Allied and neutral ships were frequently attacked. Voluntary rationing was introduced in the same year, bread was subsidized by September, and from December rationing became compulsory as wheat supplies decreased to just six weeks worth. In 1918, butter, sugar, margarine, lard and meat followed, although by then the U-boats were less of a problem thanks to the system of convoys and other countermeasures. Despite the hardships, GDP increased during the war by 14%, while the German economy shrank by 27%. Of course, while civilian consumption decreased, government spending exploded, reaching 38% of GDP. Britain spent its financial reserves and borrowed heavily from the USA, which became the main beneficiary of the war. American food and raw materials kept Britain alive, but we should also mention the contribution of Australia, New Zealand, Canada and South Africa, as these territories both profited from the war, economically speaking, and also sacrificed their men who died by the thousands on the battlefields. British India deserves its own video, hundreds of thousands served in the British military from the start of the conflict all the way to the armistice. Naturally, arms production skyrocketed, by the end of the war, a year's worth of pre-war production of light munitions could be completed in just four days. To support the industry, government control was introduced, while labor unions were regulated, although their membership continued to grow, even women were grudgingly accepted, as they took over various jobs from the men who had gone to war. Coal production was essential, but imported oil was just as important, 85% of which was supplied by the US. Fuel oil for the Navy, which consumed 12,500 tons a month, was provided by the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. Aircraft production also thrived, the Royal Flying Corps continued to expand, primitive reconnaissance planes were followed by modern fighters and bombers, although in certain periods, like in April 1917, the expected lifespan of British pilots were measured in mere days. Just like everywhere else, propaganda played an important role. It tried to bolster morale through the distribution of books, photographs, maps, cartoons, etc. After the failed Battle of the Somme, the coalition government fell apart. David Lloyd George became prime minister, who was himself a liberal, but was willing to form a majority conservative coalition government. The idea of a total war was promulgated, everything was subordinated to the war effort. In 1917, as King George changed the name of his family to the House of Windsor, and the Germans retreated to the new Hindenburg Line, the British army under General Haig attempted another offensive at Passchendaele in a sea of mud, but after losing another 300,000 men, they had to give up. In November, they tried again at Cambrai, using tanks en masse for the first time, but German reinforcements prevented a breakthrough, 75,000 men and 180 tanks were lost. In 1918, the German Spring Offensive was launched, with five separate attacks, hitting British troops first. They once again approached Paris, advancing 65 kilometers, but Lloyd George rushed another half a million men to France and also overcame a crisis in Parliament. By August, the German army was exhausted, fresh American, British and French troops pushed them back, until Germany asked for armistice in November. After losing one million killed, the war was now over. In the subsequent peace negotiations, Britain tried to curb excessive French demands, as the British were still interested in a divided continent with a relative balance of power, but they were also glad to divide the former territories of the Central Powers among themselves. By 1921, the British Empire was even larger, 
with additions in Africa, the Pacific and the Middle East, but the conflict exhausted Britain, so in the next two decades it would spend most of its energy maintaining its crumbling empire. As promised, I will talk about these topics in more detail in the future. Thank you for watching, see you next time!